And we would love if you could please just use the Q&A button that's located at the bottom of your screen. And that way the questions all be in one nice place for our moderator. And without further ado, I'm gonna tell you just very briefly about who I am, what the Hive Think Tank does before we get this uh, event rolling. We have an incredible panel for you guys today. So my name is Maddie Watt. I am the Senior Manager of People and Programs at the Hive. Uh, today's session is gonna be recorded and it will be available later for those who have registered on Zoom. At the Hive, we do something called the Hive Think Tank, and that is an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, corporations, thought leaders. And what the Hive Think Tank does is we are offering events and content for you guys about every week uh, focused on AI and startups and other leading technologies. So to find out more about the Hive Think Tank, you should visit us if you're listening on Clubhouse to www.hivedata.com and I'll go ahead and drop our links in the chat if you're joining us on Zoom. Without further ado, I'm going to give the virtual mic over to TM Ravi, who is the managing director and founder of the Hive. Thank you. Thank you, Matty. And um, thanks to all of you who have joined. Uh, I see a number of the friends of the Hive, Dominique, Sanjeev, George. So thank you all for joining. Um, we also want to thank TIPCO, who is a sponsor of the Hive Think Tank for for helping us put these events together on an almost weekly basis. So the Hive is a, is, a, is a venture fund, a venture capital fund. It's a particular kind of venture capital fund, which is called a venture studio. The two unique aspects about the Hive, first is we are very focused on leveraging AI um, uh, and data and, and generally data related techniques to drive transformation across a broad set of industries. And, and so our focus is very enterprise oriented. We don't tend to do a lot of things in the consumer space. And, and so if you are an entrepreneur who, who is interested in starting a company, please reach out to us. The other unique thing about the Hive is it's a venture studio. So, so we work very closely with entrepreneurs and corporations to help them start companies and then are very active and supportive of them for the first year and a half or so uh, till they get the companies off the ground. So with that, I'll hand it over to my uh, colleague, Kamesh Raghavendra, who is going to be moderating the event today. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, uh, Hive Big Data Think Tank uh, members. Uh, and special shout out to the new members joining us on Clubhouse. Uh, welcome to this event uh, about API risks. Uh, as you must have seen in the event introduction, uh, we've used a reference to the Harry Potter Prisoner of Azkaban leaky quadrants. Uh, we believe that APIs are the future of digital transformation, uh, which also means that any gap, any risk, uh, any vulnerabilities in APIs uh, can pretty much leak the value of digital transformation. Uh, that is the theme of this event. Uh, and uh, we are fortunate to have a wonderful panel. Uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists. Uh, we have uh, Nelson Petrasek, who is the Chief Technology Officer uh, of TIPCO joining us. Uh, he's also an author uh, of a leading book uh, on APIs uh, called API Success, The Journey to Digital Transformation. Uh, we also have uh, Robin Andrus joining us today. She heads privacy in Twilio. Uh, as you can imagine, a very heavily API-driven technology and product. Uh, she is also faculty at IATP, uh, which is a, a professional network of privacy practitioners. Um, uh, so before handing it over to the panelists uh, to introduce themselves, I'd like to uh, start an icebreaker. Uh, I would love to have all of us share our pet peeves uh, with apps and APIs, particularly those apps that make you feel nervous uh, when you're using them or not using them. Um, uh, I would love to have our panelists also mention uh, apps that have made them nervous, whether it's a mobile app or otherwise. Uh, my pet peeve is mobile banking apps, especially when I'm not using a mobile banking app. What the hell is the app doing with my financial information? Uh, so I end up logging off my mobile banking app uh, every time I'm not using it. Um, so I hand it over to the panelists, uh, but I would love to have the audience uh, chime in uh, through messages uh, about their pet peeves uh, with APIs. 
uh, maybe we can start with uh, Robin and then uh, move to Nelson uh, for their introduction and, and opening comments. Uh, and then we'll get uh, started with the panel discussion. Sure. Thank you. Robin? Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Tamish, for the introduction. Um, so uh, should I do pet peeves first of apps? Absolutely. Yes. Um, <laughs> Well, I've been in the privacy space for a while. So for me, it's a lot about what is that app doing and collecting about your data. So I don't know if I'd call it a pet peeve, but I just feel that I'm educated and I'm aware of what occurs out there. Um, for me, the, the big you know concerns have really been around the Facebooks of the world, like the apps that are collecting your data um, for monetizing, for advertising, and like, like the Cambridge Analytica example is a perfect example. Um, and so, you know, having proper privacy protections and programs around what data is being shared through APIs and notice and choice is what I would call a pet peeve I've constantly been aware of, but I'm glad that there's being more progress in the privacy space to identify and notify those for consumers. Um, so I'll give you a little bit more background about myself. I am the director of privacy at Twilio. I, um, and I've been in the privacy space now for 12 years with experience at Yahoo, at Google internally in their privacy function, and also at TrustArc, a privacy consulting company. My background before privacy is I was in enterprise risk and audit at the consulting firm Deloitte. And I'm really excited to be here today to provide actionable guidance to attendees to think about how to really build scalable privacy programs and processes to mitigate API risk. Nelson? All right, well, just to, uh, just to add to that, I mean, I know for myself, uh, I mean, all these points mentioned around apps are, are all fantastic. Uh, the ones that kind of worry me are the ones where you can control your car. <laughs> I, I'm not sure about that aspect of apps and all the APIs that are driving that. And I know that uh, we actually work with a number of car manufacturers and, and some of the work that they're doing behind the scenes. Uh, that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So definitely, if you want to talk about API risks, there's some certain elements and aspects to that and that part of the uh, technology as well. But um, so I'm, I'm Nelson Petrachik, CTO for TIBCO. And as was mentioned, one of the areas in which we do specialize in is the area of APIs. Uh, I did have the opportunity to even uh, write a little bit about API programs and, and how to get going with an API program, uh, just to kind of cover off a little bit on that topic. But uh, yeah, we again, thank you uh, to the Hive. We love partnering with the Hive in these activities. And all these sessions are always interesting. Uh, so yeah, so definitely make sure that you follow the Hive and check out all their events. Uh, they're all fantastic. So yeah, we're we definitely happy to have that relationship with you guys. Awesome. Thanks a lot, uh, Robin and Nelson, uh, for joining us today. Uh, I'm just reading out from some of the messages I'm seeing here. Uh, so Sanjeev looks like he's like me. He's, uh, he's nervous about finance, FinTech type of apps, Mint, Fidelity, uh, played in you know, the acquisition that uh, Visa made some months ago. Uh, uh, Sanjay is also uh, uh, nervous about Uber. Uh, actually, it's an interesting, I interviewed somebody from Uber uh, and the amount of gyroscopic information they process, especially Uber Eats, uh, they analyze your movement when the food is arriving. With that, they psychographically profile you, how hungry you are, that type of things. Uh, they analyze the movements of the uh, driver uh, and use that as feedback mechanism and rating mechanism, it was quite scary and revealing uh, the kind of analysis Uber does uh, uh, with the data they collect through their mobile apps. Um, anyway, so so uh, as uh, you know, we've seen in the comments, uh, it's obvious that mobile apps are basically built, and the entire mobile app economy uh, is is built on the structures of uh, APIs and API interfaces. Uh, but increasingly, we've also seen. Uh, APIs dominate innovation and digital transformation in the enterprise. Um, so I would love to get the panel's uh, opinion uh, on how enterprise application stacks and the way an, an enterprise is digitally transformed and enterprises architected uh, is getting redefined uh, with the advent of APIs in both cloud native and SaaS applications. Uh, maybe we can start with Nelson um, and, and then continue the discussion with Robert. Sure. Well, that sounds good. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I'm, I'm pretty sure most people that would be on this call, uh, you know, most of the enterprises that we work with nowadays, they are at least aware of the fact that they do need to look at their systems with a very much, you know, a, a API lens, if you will. 
uh, it's kind of old news, right? This whole notion of API led, you know, API first application development, uh, start with your API contracts, uh, do some testing even before your development occurs. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later on in this session, uh, especially since we're talking about risk and how to reduce risk. Uh, you know, this whole notion around automation and, and DevOps and incorporating APIs into that particular set of pipelines. Um, and then also uh, APIs uh, in terms of facilitating what I call the XOps. Uh, for, for a while there, everything was being named ops. So there was AI ops and DevSecOps. And of course you had DevOps which kind of started the trend maybe and things like that. Um, but really when you dig underneath the covers, it's a lot of around APIs and APIs enabling those capabilities. And, and so I think most, most people would understand that APIs are really the way in which people are really approaching things like integration. Uh, it's how you're accessing data. It's how you're accessing key business functions. Uh, and it's actually no longer just about things like REST. Uh, you do have things like event-driven APIs, uh, APIs at the edge. How do you do edge analytics and enable that through APIs? So, so all of these things are really kind of coming together and really changing the way that people are looking at the functions that they have, how they expose those functions, uh, how they expose data uh, and, and other capabilities that they provide, and then how they make that available, not just internally, but also externally as well, which again, leads us to, uh, to a more relevant conversation around risks. So, so I, Kind of old news, but bringing out a, a lot of new themes and a lot of new topics um, because of the prevalence and because of the focus on APIs. Absolutely, and Robin would love to hear your thoughts on this, and especially as Nelson mentioned, APIs blur the difference between inside and outside an enterprise uh, with mobile, edge, cloud, cloud native, uh, traditional uh, applications an enterprise has. Uh, so in your opinion, uh, how does governance or even the notion of internal control, what is internal after all in, in this kind of a, a tapestry of APIs uh, all across, uh, would, would, love to, would love to hear your comments on that. So how I think of it as a privacy professional coming from a risk and compliance standpoint, working very closely with the developers and engineers who are looking to implement these, um, for example, if I was to go to a brand new company that said I'd like to build a, you know, a program from the ground up, I would think about, you know, you know, major work streams to mitigate risk within a program. First of all, like what APIs would, would they like to use and how, right? Let's at least identify the APIs they'd like to use. What sort of data would, would be shared throughout these APIs internally and externally? Is it something like with financial services you know, your credentials that are highly sensitive and if breached, it could be a huge impact to your brand and your company. Um, you know, have you done, have you looked at the privacy and security controls of these third-party APIs? Have you looked at their terms? Have you done an internal audit have, and a vendor analysis of how they process data? What are their internal controls? Have, do they, have they done certain frameworks like a SOC 2 and other um, sort of security certifications? Is it clearly documented on their website? Are they being transparent with you? So, you know, really vetting this third party, because if something was to happen and there was a breach, you, be your name and your brand on the line as well. Um, and then talking about a breach, you know, if there was a breach, hypothetically, do you have a process in place to notify your customers and regulators if you need to? So those, those are some basic steps I would go through as you think about building out an API program or even improving your governance and risk around it. Improving your governance and risk around it. Absolutely, absolutely. So I do notice a slight uh, lag between the Zoom audio and the Clubhouse audio. Uh, so in case uh, there's some overlap, uh, apologies in advance. Uh, great, great comments, uh, Robin, especially uh, the, the comment you made about the, the workflow, uh, you know, the way data moves in and out uh, between APIs that could have different origins and different sources uh, and, and how we need to now need to catalog and, and scan and monitor uh, this kind of complexity. Um, and, and, and that goes to a more fundamental question, which is traditionally when a client would connect to a service, whether it's on-prem or cloud, uh, there was determinism. You knew exactly what would happen and you know, what flow of control uh, would trigger uh, when, when a message was passed or when a document was sent and so on and so forth. Uh, but in, the, in today's world of APIs, there's no determinism in the, in the flow of control. Um, and therefore, the, the actual application workflow uh, gets determined on the fly 
uh, uh, you know, would, would love to uh, start with Nelson on this topic of, of flow of control uh, and, and what is even you know, the definition of an application workflow um, uh, when, when it's just a, an API calling other API calling other API um, and, and how do enterprises uh, cope with this type of a very excessively dynamic uh, application architecture? No, that's, that's a good point because the way in which people are assembling uh, ap applications these days, um, when you're assembling these different APIs, you're right, there is no sequential flow of control that we're normally and typically used to. I mean, people are, first of all, building APIs using all the, all the practices you hear about, right? Properly bounded business contexts. You have different owners for these APIs, treat APIs as products. I mean, all these things come into play. Um, and, that, and that's all great and wonderful, and I'm, I'm not definitely arguing any of that, but it then leads to a, a change in the way that you assemble and build applications. And you're seeing this all the way from what I call kind of the, the lower or the bottom tier, right? The system kind of APIs, if you will, the ones that are wrapping legacy systems, all the way straight up through to the front end. Now with patterns and trends around you know, micro front ends and, and these different capabilities, some of those concepts even are being applied to the UIs. And so you now have this very multi-layered aspect to APIs and you, you're intertwining APIs with legacy systems and the legacy systems are necessarily geared towards being exposed in the same way as some of these APIs uh, want to expose them. And so you're not only concerned in terms of how you're gonna wire the APIs themselves together, but then the flow in which that single request may actually result in a whole bunch of other sequences of activities in the underlying legacy uh, our applications or the architecture as well. So it, it's definitely changing the way that you build applications. Um, it's exposing different functions, different capabilities, again, not only internally, but externally to enable the building of those applications. It's reducing the amount of time it takes to build applications, absolutely. And we've seen that on projects. Um, we've especially seen this over the last year as organizations have quickly tried to pivot. And some customers have been able to pivot quickly because it was just a matter of reassembling APIs in a different way. But that is going to also lead to a number of challenges, shall we say. Um, you've got all this independent development going on, which you need coordination control across all these different APIs, which may span different properly bounded business contexts, if you will. And then you get into different patterns and how you handle that and compensate for errors. And so there's a, it also brings about a, this kind of mix of complexity when you're mashing together and using, using that term here because of the APIs, bringing APIs with legacy and multiple levels all the way to the edge. I mean, you've got quite a complex web of interactions now that you need to make sense out of and, and ensure you're not exposing any risks. Absolutely, thank you, Nelson. Uh, Robin, there's a question here uh, that relates to a topic we had discussed uh, together earlier about artificial intelligence. Uh, this question comes from uh, Sanjeev. Uh, he, he talks about uh, the additional risks uh, that applications that uh, use AI algorithms face, particularly because uh, when there is an API-driven architecture uh, and, and the AI algorithm is just scraping data from multiple sources, uh, you can't even think of for a given model, which are the data sources that can be associated with it because it's just trying to grab whatever data it's, it's able to grab from the, all the API interfaces, it's just scanning through. Um, uh, and this relates to uh, uh, you know, attribution, governance, uh, ultimately ethics of AI and all those questions. Uh, so Robin, if we get if you could share your opinion uh, and observations about uh, APIs, uh, specifically in the context of uh, AI-driven applications. Yeah, so from the privacy and ethical perspective, AI and the use of AI, I mean, AI in general is obviously is an amazing technology to enable within our business. Um, from the privacy perspective, you know, you'll want to think about the data that's being collected through the AI, especially sensitive categories under the GDPR, um, you know, because th there are specific call outs about collecting and building models and of AI data for internal use that could be considered especially discriminatory, especially for, for example, you know, right here, you're talking about Workday, Salesforce, Oracle, and SAP. Some of the data in there might not necessarily be sensitive or might be discriminatory, but from a privacy perspective, what a lot of companies are looking at is, um, you know, is this model that we're building to identify candidates or if someone gets a job or promotion, is the AI inadvertently um, 
building a model that's discriminatory. It's not trying to do what it's meant to do. Or are we using PII in a way, personally identifiable information or personal data tied to an individual that they're not aware of or, or obtaining proper notice and choice around? Um, the, the, U, the UK ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, they're actually the privacy regulator in the UK. They've come out with a great um, AI ethics and auditing standard. So if you're thinking about using AI within your organization, within APIs, and just in general, building more machine learning models is really to think about doing it right from an ethical perspective. Nelson, do you have anything to add around you know, the use of AI within APIs? Well, I mean, you've, you've got the AI requirements that are scanning existing APIs. So that's one aspect to it. You've got AI within the use of the APIs themselves. Um, and then that takes a couple different paths because you've got AI ML that's being exposed by an API or AI ML that's being used to manage and monitor or even uh, uh, perform things like threat detection within an API. So there's there's actually different levels of which you can talk about AI ML from a, an API context. Um, and there is, you know, if you look at some situations uh, some of the open banking initiatives and so on and so forth, uh, the way that a lot of these systems would allow you to gather information about you um, so that you can aggregate, you know, your different accounts from different banks into a single application, for example, uh, a lot of that was actually done through screen scraping. And so you had to effectively authorize that app to have access to each of your different bank accounts. Um, there's obviously risk associated with that. And so if you can hide that behind an API, then you can mitigate some of that risk but AIML can still have a play in terms of, again, scanning these APIs. You see a lot of situations where APIs are actually directly reflecting the underlying legacy system. And that can be a hint, um, both to hackers and AIML models that are being used for good purposes um, in terms of what the underlying system actually represents. And you may and probably don't want that. Um, so, you know, that's, and that's at that level in terms of API usage, but then again, you can expose models as APIs and then you need to make sure that that API is doing the right things with that model and what the model is distributing to that API is being managed and governed. Uh, and then again, well, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but you can use AI ML to actually manage and monitor the environment itself. Because getting people to do it, it just, it's just simply too complex. You can't have people managing and monitoring every single API interaction log file through every single layer of the uh, architecture. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'll take a couple of questions. A lot of interesting conversations in the chat here. Uh, I'm trying to keep up uh, with all the very interesting comments coming here. Uh, this question is from Jeff, uh, and he asks about uh, essentially the difference between internal and external APIs. Uh, are they different because of the nature of the clients that connect to them? External APIs uh, or go external clients, internal APIs, internal clients. Uh, how do we even differentiate uh, in this kind of interconnected blurred line type of world uh, between internal and external APIs. I'll also pile up one more question on that, which is kind of orthogonally related. Uh, this question uh, is from uh, Dominic. Uh, it's about security and access control. Uh, and, and it's about the recent uh, SolarWinds uh, incident, uh, security threat. Uh, and and uh, he asks about uh, rethinking APIs, uh, access control uh, and upstream security. Uh, in the wake of uh, some of the breaches that we have seen. In my mind, it translates to, uh, you know, do the uh, kind of governance and, and access control mechanisms of the traditional enterprise, uh, which might have assumed an internal API type of trust and, and model, uh, do they still hold good uh, in, in this wild, wild uh, blurred line, uh, you know, cloud mobile edge uh, type of APIs that, that we see today in the world? Um, so uh, would love to hear both your opinions on this. Uh, uh, maybe we can start with Nelson and, and, and then Robin. Sure. sure. So, I mean, sure. just to start with that, I mean, uh, historically, there's kind of a bit of a mismatch between the way access, you know, Auth and Auth Z, Z, depending on where you're from, uh, was managed when it came to uh, just how people got access and, and what they were able to do with their systems. I mean, traditionally, what, you gave a username, password, and all of a sudden you had access to a whole bunch of stuff. And, and that was enough. And the system never checked again. It just assumed that that gave you access then to different functions, features, capabilities, or whatnot within your perimeter. 
right? And that's how people tended to look at security. It was very perimeter based. It was maybe, it, it assumed that if you got through the perimeter, you had more uh, ability to do things, right? You still lock it down and then don't get me wrong. It's not like security just magically went away, but it was very much the focus. And so now what you're seeing is with APIs and this blurring between internal and external, I agree in a large number of cases, it's more just based on the audience, but even that line is, is blurring. Again, as you take all these aspects of where APIs can sit and who they're servicing, you, you have to look and you know, that, that impedance mismatch needs to be addressed within an organization. And the problem is getting bigger, not smaller, because of course people are expanding their footprints to things like cloud and to the edge. And so these existing IT systems, which are originally based on a very perimeter based security model, um, all that has to change. Access controls were typically not at the API level, they're at the application level. Uh, now you have multiple teams working on these things. Things are shifting dramatically. You spin up a new VM, you introduce some new containers, you spin them down, IP addresses change. It's a very, very, very dynamic environment now. And so some of the traditional mechanisms for dealing with access control will have to change. And this is why you see conversations around things like uh, zero trust networks, right? So when, forget about just the perimeter. Once you're, in, once you're inside, you still don't have access to everything. You need to make sure that you're continuously authenticating, authorizing people as they're trying to do different things. So it's not based on location. It's not just based on username and password, but it's based on who you are, the context, uh, maybe even using AI, ML, AI, ML in a behavioral context. Uh, and then seeing what it is, your, what that action is that you're trying to do in that particular context and applying security at that level. So it, the, the impedance mismatch has to change, right? Otherwise um, you are going to run into issues like solar winds and you're going to run into issues inside of that quote unquote traditional perimeter. Absolutely, Robin, any thoughts on this question? Right. Um... As you talk about internal and external, we also, you also want to make sure that any third parties you're using, you're really vetting that they're actually processing your data as a processor, which from a privacy and legal perspective, it's a term that's in the GDPR and other regulations, you know, the CCPA as a service provider. But the point is, is, is you also want to really think about um, that you enter a relationship with these businesses or these APIs from a contractual standpoint that they are only processing your company's data per um, on your behalf. And that's really important to think about just, you know, that you, you're using these vendors that are not just taking your data and doing whatever they want to for their own purposes. Um, those are specific guide rails, guidelines that are actually in the GDPR that many companies you know, follow. And also you want to think about it from a strategic standpoint too is, you know, you're using this API or this vendor for your own business. Do you want them to have access to your data for their own purposes? So that's just more on the, you know, contractual side of obtaining a third party API or vendor. From the security side, yeah, I can't, and the access control side, I can't echo enough what Nelson has said. You know, you really need to think about what your internal access processes for this data and make sure there is a strong information policy or data governance program and practice within your company. Um, you know, who has access to these APIs internally? How do you, if they leave, how do you um, remove the access? You know, what sorts of sensitivity, really a least privilege process. So making sure you have least privilege access control process, the technical programs in place and the people and the technology um, to really make sure that this is can automate and scale as well to protect your, your company and your data. Thanks, Robin. Uh, and actually, Robin, there's a related question uh, here from Robert, uh, who asks, uh, are there any certifications uh, that measure or, or quantify security or privacy risks uh, associated, associated with APIs? They could even be frameworks. Uh, you mentioned uh, some of those in your, in your earlier comments. Uh, it would be great if you could elaborate on that. I can tell you that many there, there's, our, there's different cert security certifications that you should look at what a company has. And generally you should see it on their website if they're transparent, like SOC 2, just internal controls, several ISO standards, ISO security standards. Um, from a privacy perspective, there really isn't one overarching like GDPR certification. Um, and that's actually specifically written in the GDPR that in order for them to there be a GDPR certification, the European Commission actually has to approve the 
the third party that's doing the auditing of these companies. And that hasn't happened even though the GDPR came out almost three years ago. There are, um, you are starting to see, there is a new ISO certification for processors where they look at several privacy considerations that we're starting to see more companies start to look at in the industry. And another framework is the NIST privacy risk framework, which is a standard that was created by the you know, National Institute of Standards of Technology, and, but it's specifically around privacy risk um, that your business, you know, that your business, your API or your business would like to, like a, an, an internal assessment. And you could start to ask third parties if they, what sort of privacy frameworks or audits have they had around their privacy program and security program and vet them that way. Awesome, thanks, thanks Robin. Uh, we had also discussed in, in some of our previous conversations about this notion of an API life cycle. Um, it's particularly relevant uh, when you pretty much uh, don't control most of the APIs that you're using. Uh, the life cycle doesn't just involve your organization or, or the company uh, you're representing or even as an individual, uh, it's not controlled by a single vendor. Um, uh, so what does life cycle mean uh, in, in this type of uh, 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 very dynamic uh, multi-vendor, multi-vendor, multi-developer uh, type of life cycle? Um, and, and obviously in, in such a complex life cycle, uh, risk is going to be uh, quite severe and, and quite hard to track. Um, so I would love to hear from uh, both the panelists uh, about your thoughts on how should uh, software development life cycle or risk management life cycle uh, evolve or be redefined uh, to deal with APIs. Yeah, I mean, uh, sure, go yeah, ahead. Sure, go ahead. Take, take a shot at take it. I, shot I found out. my mute button. The uh, the idea. I mean, I, so first of all, definitely the traditional life cycle that you would use for development has changed. And that is even just for APIs that you're developing internally. Right? There's, there's definitely that aspect of it as well. So, you know, people go through the standard parts of the life cycle, right? Your whole, you know, you come up with a brilliant idea, you get your requirements, you do your design, hopefully you do some testing early with mock apps and things like that. Um, and then eventually they do a deployment. Now, people forget that the life cycle then at that point is not over. And so you still got aspects of things like versioning, you still got things like when do you actually deprecate an API as, as Robin had alluded to earlier, um, that actually in some ways is more important from a risk standpoint because certain APIs that are deemed to be old or not used oftentimes get to kind of are forgotten about. And I've seen APIs that are out there running and people just quite frankly forgot because they're managing some of these things in spreadsheets and it, it's just it just becomes a very complex mess if you will. So. So that's just internal. Then you take that across all the different other vendors and third-party APIs that you're incorporating into your APIs, which is part of the benefit, but also part of the risk, right? How are they managing their processes? What are they doing with their APIs? How are they making sure that their APIs and the security model around those APIs conforms to the latest versions and standards and specifications and things like that? Um, are they using proper API contract definitions? What are those definitions? How are the payloads defined? So there's a lot of those kinds of questions that you don't just have to answer with your own internal processes, but also across your different vendors um, that you're incorporating. And again, Robin alluded to this, just having an idea of what your vendors are doing, never mind what you're doing is, is also very key. So, it, and there's, there's different ways to deal with this, right? So there's techniques around things like just, just having understanding of what you have, just cataloging the APIs. Uh, both from a technical and business metadata standpoint. So you've got what is, what's the business use behind the APIs? What is it doing? What data is it exposing? Uh, and what is the nature of that data? And then you've also got the technical aspects of it. Where is it? Who manages it? What's the security model around it? What does it depend on? And so on. So you, you've got you know, that aspect of it that you want to do. And it, this is very similar to what you would do on the data side. People have all kinds of data sets now that they've collected. Um, they've thrown them all into a data lake. What do you do with that? How do you know what you have? How good is it? Same, same concepts still apply actually to APIs in, in this sense. Uh, and then you, you have other things like, um, again, don't let the underlying details leak uh, in turn through the API. So um, don't, don't have an API that just exposes a SQL interface as an example. Uh, things like that are going to be bad. Um, but even what some of the data elements are, the naming conventions that you're using, that can actually expose information that 
you perhaps don't want to expose in that way, right? Again, some of these implementation details. Um, and then I've seen some, um, some usage or some ex exploration around things like knowledge graphs uh, or kind of a, an API graph concept, if you will, um, which, it, which attempts to define not just the endpoints and their attributes, but also the relationships between each of those endpoints and attributes, both internally and externally. So the life cycle is much more involved. There's a lot more dependencies. Uh, it's more complex. There's additional stages you need to worry about. And that's not just inside your, you know, quote unquote firewall, but it's outside as well to your third party vendors and partners. Uh, I can, I can so, jump in here. Please, please, Robin. So um, as a privacy professional, you know, we really follow the data or follow the PII, right? And so some of the things that Nelson was mentioning during the API lifecycle is a, let's know, let know what APIs you're using at any given point, right? Like which APIs are you connecting to? What data are you sharing with them? Are you properly mapping your data? Um, you know, do you know where it's being shared in transit and at rest? That's really one of the things that, you know, a lot of companies before the GDPR was put in place in 2018 and then the CCPA recently, like companies didn't know the amount of data and PII they were processing and where it was being stored. and you know, they know like engineers would always have system level maps, like they could say with the data goes from here and goes to here, but it would never say what types of data. Um, like, is there PII in there? Is there sensitive data in there? Like someone's social security number. So, you know, one of the really key things that has come out from a lot of these pri privacy rules and regulations is much more awareness around data, the mapping of where the data actually lives. So, you know, that, that's one thing I would definitely think about in your life cycle is not just the engineering and technical aspects. Um, also, as I think about, you know, there are API standards, right? So putting in place standards around privacy and security, building those standards internally. Um, and, you know, like how I would think of the API life cycle, like if Nelson was a chief technology officer of somewhere I was working, I would say, Nelson, let's make sure that we put in place a, you know, a good privacy program around these APIs that you'd like to enable. And it's, let's get, you know, let's get executive buy-in because that's usually, you know, get a steering committee or executive buy-in because that's really where you need to drive some of these privacy and security programs is from the top. Once you've got that buy-in, um, you know, the budget, you need to identify some key stakeholders. You know, there's this concept in the privacy space of a privacy or security champion. And it, it's been around for a while because it's just been known that, you know, privacy has always been, you know, this risk and compliance function historically, like knocking on people's doors saying, do this, do that. Um, definitely in the last three years though, since there's been so much more awareness around privacy, I, you're, I'm starting to see that change, but within the privacy industry, there's this concept of a privacy champion. So, you know, if I don't have someone in my privacy team to help drive privacy awareness, you know, on top of basic training within, let's say the, a particular like IT function, I'd say, hey, Joe, you know, can you help be my privacy champion? Can you really help implement this internally? And that has worked successfully in many companies to drive it until, you know, they can hire someone dedicated to privacy. Um, so those are, those are some other, you know, have that champion build the program, but then also have some sort of risk and gap analysis program is what are the risks? What are the risks of using these APIs from a privacy and security perspective? How are you identifying, mapping them and, and, and um, resolving the risks and identifying and reporting the gaps up to the right executives or the board? So that's another thing to think about from the risk management lifecycle of using APIs. Awesome, thanks Robin. Uh, by the way, I picked this question from uh, Nelson's uh, book, the ninth chapter, uh, understanding API life cycles. <laughs> and Robin, I especially appreciated uh, your comments on the, the process and the program aspects of making privacy risk management, but in general, um, application risk management uh, work in a, in a large enterprise. Um, would love to double down on that uh, uh, with your help and understand aspects of accountability, um, organizational structure, um, and, and even uh, kind of mitigative processes around monitoring and governance from a human organization standpoint. Um, how do you see uh, organizations evolving to cope with these new types of risks? In general, there's, um, 
you know, there's different, these different control frameworks and risk frameworks, right? So you have the GDPR, you have the CCPA, you have the NIST privacy risk framework, you have the ISO. And they're, if you think of like a Sarbanes-Oxley or internal control program, they're very much written the same way, like company has access controls. Um, so I would, you know, in addition to when you're building out your privacy program, I would definitely think about building a solid privacy or security GRC program or governance risk and compliance program. So um, it might be somewhat manual in the beginning, but having an expert that can make sure like what's our structure, what's our governance of our program, right? You've got that in place. You have the stakeholders, you have the executive buy-in. What is, what are the risks, right? Using, identifying a framework to use to kind of map those risks and, and putting that in place. And um, another approach would be you know, eventually thinking about how you could automate it. So, you know, there are more tools out there that can help identify, you know, where the data is being shared, how it's being shared and automate the risks, automate the, the, um, the scoring of the risks or building some sort of way to quantify the risk and show that you're moving and improving and reducing the risk to the business. Absolutely. Uh, 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 thanks, Robin. And there's some interesting chat conversation going on uh, around privacy by design. Uh, I think, Robin, you, you uh, commented a couple of times on the chat. Uh, maybe you can speak a, a little bit about that for the uh, rest of the audience. And maybe after that, Nelson, uh, you can chime in on this concept of privacy by design. Yeah, of course. Um, so privacy by design is actually a buzzword that was initially introduced by at the time, I want to say in the, in the early 2000s, Anne Kavukian, the uh, privacy commissioner from Canada. And so it's actually a term that's been around in the privacy industry even way before the GDPR came out. But the concept is always that, you know, as soon as you're building in a, like, let's say you're a tech company building a new product or you are, you know, an, uh, implementing a new API within your organization to use, really thinking about building it with privacy from the very beginning. And there's also a concept of security by design. So it's really thinking about in the blueprint phase when the engineers are mapping out what this product is going to do and how the data is going to be stored, it's building it in from the very beginning. Um, thinking about access, deletion, retention, um, how the data is encrypted, what data they're collecting, data minimization. Do you really need to collect all that data about your customers if you don't need it? So building in those fundamentals in the very beginning. However, in, in 2018, when the GDPR was put into place, they actually put that in as, a, as an article of the GDPR. So now, you know, if a company was sued by, or fined by the European regulators for a infraction, they could look into more like their development processes and say, did you build this with privacy by design in mind? So that's where I think the privacy by design concept really got a lot more teeth is in 2018 when the GDPR went into place and companies are really thinking about it and really building in privacy from the ground up from the beginning, which as a privacy geek like myself, it makes me excited. Awesome, thanks Robin. Uh, Nelson, uh, any more, any comments on this? Yeah, no, I think, I, I mean, that's a key point. Plus it's yeah, it came from Canada. So, you know, who am I to argue with that since I'm from Canada? But the, um, yeah, definitely, I, you, I agree with the point that this has to be built in from the beginning. I mean, again, if we go back to the API lifecycle and impacts to that lifecycle, um, being able to build privacy, security, um, be able to identify what data is going to be shared, what data should not be shared, uh, you know, those kinds of things need to be looked at right at the very beginning. Uh, I mean, how many times you know, traditionally does software get built and then at the end it does stuff and then they come in and say, well, I guess we should actually do some kind of risk or security audit around this. Maybe they even, maybe they don't even really do that, right? Some of it's industry specific and certain guidelines and regulations that require it. But for the most part, it always, it has not always been a very formal part and official part of the process. So that's changing though. Right. Again, given all the factors and, and reasons that we've mentioned, uh, GDPR and you know government regulations and so on and so forth, you know those kinds of things, it, you have to build that in early on. And uh, so privacy by design, the practices around that, starting earlier rather than later. And, and the other key element to this is the whole notion of um, uh, just monitoring and, and the ability to actually tell you 
whether or not the APIs are conforming to certain guidelines and best practices around security and privacy. If you don't properly instrument your systems and your APIs and, every, and, and the traffic path and pattern that those APIs are, are either exposing or promoting or utilizing, you, you may not even be able to answer this question, at least not easily. So part of that privacy by design is actually properly instrumenting your API so that you can understand both at an application level and even all the way down to a network level, what is going on when somebody calls that API. I completely agree. You know, one of the things that as privacy professionals we strive to do is kind of build like a playbook or standards for the business to instrument their technology properly to build those privacy by design in and have a repeatable process. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for your comments. I, I see a question here, which can be a good round table uh, between the three of us. It's a question from Sanjeev, uh, who has asked for examples of uh, leaky cauldrons, uh, examples of APIs that have gone bad. Uh, Parler uh, comes uh, from recent uh, memory. Um, I've also, my, uh, the, my kids play on this platform called Roblox. It's a gaming platform. Uh, it's from my own personal experience. Uh, so Roblox has an API uh, that is exposes to every game that is hosted on the gaming platform. Um, it particularly has an API where you can ping for the online status of a particular user of the platform. And they've done that so that uh, gamers in one game can see uh, the entire Roblox community, even if they are not in that particular game, but playing some other game. They've done that to encourage some kind of collaboration. But I felt there was a, a, a design gap in that API because now an external uh, client, which is not even a game on Roblox, uh, can do a massive scan of uh, random Roblox IDs and keep tracking, you know, which given that most of the gamers on Roblox are minor kids, um, it can actually track the online activity, you know, which IDs come online at what time, gone off online at what time. Um, at least personally, maybe it's legally not an issue, but personally I found it a, a gap uh, in privacy by design. Um, I would love to hear kind of your uh, experiences of uh, gaps in APIs or APIs gone back uh, uh, pertaining to this conversation. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we see all kinds of examples, right? I mean, anything from uh, people not running the latest and greatest versions of software, uh, which then results in some sort of a uh, hack. Uh, we've seen, I've seen people underestimating the creativity of hackers, shall we say, um, and their ability to find those loopholes. Uh, so you've seen that. Um, I've seen just, I mean, just basic configuration errors. I mean, all those kinds of things. And a lot of that just comes down to the governance, the processes, the guidelines, um, the emphasis. Uh, sometimes it's just the buy-in, as, as Robin was allu mentioned earlier, alluding to earlier. I mean, you need to buy in from the executive team to also be able to build those processes because in some cases they're just seen as expensive, <laughs> but it's really expensive if you get all that wrong. So, you know, there's those kinds of issues. Um, I also see considerations around um, not necessarily just hackers being creative, but um, just people, people in good faith being creative and actually being ahead of regulatory requirements. And so systems are being built and developed and then governments are coming in after the fact and having to catch up. And I think you saw some of that with even things like open banking. I mean, how do, do you really want to give all your credentials to a third party so that they can screen scrape your, uh, your <laughs> banking application, if you will, to get some information from you, right? Is that a good idea? I'm not so sure. So th those kinds of things, sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, who's first and uh, that can result in the, uh, the leaky cauldron, if you will. But yeah, to jump on what Nelson has said, anything that's free is not really free. You're giving them something, right? So, I mean, you know, Facebook, Google, Mint, even Mint, you know, it's, you're, you're getting the service of them, of them like scraping your, your credit card and your banking to then build your budgeting system and, you know, but you do realize that then they're also collecting that data, which they disclose properly to target advertising to you. And you know they're following the rules and they're doing it properly and they're disclosing it to you. So you, you as the consumer, you know, you need to think about the both the security risk of like if they had a hack and your your credentials were stolen, what would that happen to you, right? You know, are you on top of? I'm not getting becoming a financial planner here, but obviously, are you on top of your internet security, like program? Um, but then also about what's the value play to you? So you know, I've actually been, like I've been in the privacy space for a while and I remember 
you know, learning about all the data that ad tech companies were collecting and how they were using it again, you know, for you or against you. And, um, you know, for me, actually Mint, I like as a tool and I'm willing to accept the, the risk that, um, you know, they're collecting my credentials and storing them. And I, you know, I, I hope to, I trust their, their internet security in them as a, as a company. I'd much rather having them process it a tax company than, you know, some smaller startup. Um, but to me, the value of Mint, you know, I do actually like their budgeting features. So I'm okay with them using my data for advertising. It doesn't bother me. You know, sometimes they'll give me a good credit card suggestion. That's okay. Um, so there's, there's something else I was going to mention that I forgot. Um, but really just about the value, there, there can be a value to these APIs. You just need to investigate them and understand both as a consumer and as an, as an enterprise, how you're using them. Absolutely, Robin. And that comes to the uh, topic of tooling. Uh, and, and traditionally, IT tools uh, have been oriented around uh, applications, uh, both on-prem and, and uh, on the cloud. Uh, they've been oriented around access, uh, access control, and that type of topics. Um, are the present uh, kind of uh, IT tooling options that are available for enterprises really sufficient um, to cope up with the granularity of APIs, the unstructured workflows that APIs stitch together, and of course, the scale uh, of the number of API endpoints related to the number of clunkier applications? Uh, this question also relates to a, a question from Peter here in the Q&A. Uh, who asks about uh, uh, scanning uh, the parameters, uh, the data that's uh, passed through API endpoints, um, and, and whether it's necessary to check the values, uh, to scan the information in the context of uh, regulatory requirements, in the context of uh, enterprise policies. Um, and this also reminds me of uh, one of my portfolio companies uh, at the Hive. Uh, it's called Data Secrets, uh, which is essentially uh, uh, a more modern and a more API centric uh, tooling uh, to deal with information security and privacy risks. Um, and to Peter's question, uh, this particular product, Data Secrets, actually exactly does that. Uh, it has the capability of uh, interpreting the values passed in an API endpoint uh, and detect uh, compliance gaps, uh, policy gaps um, uh, that uh, you know, Peter mentions here in the question. Um, but Robin would love to hear your take on uh, the current state of tooling uh, and, and where do you see gaps uh, in the current set of IT tools available? Right. So there's, you know, the general, generally the IT tooling space that I'm more familiar with um, around the GRC space, it's more traditional GRC systems like Archer, you know, ident or SAP ServiceNow, identifying the you know, the controls and how an organization would meet the controls. Um, what we are starting to see in the privacy tech space, it's this new emerging space of new um, technology and AI companies starting to really help solve um, privacy problems for companies and help them comply with regulations like GDPR and CCPA are starting to see tools like data secrets and, you know, that can actually map the API data and automatically help risk score your, your privacy risk against different frameworks and regulations. So, you know, to me, I think that the, the growth in these new tools and opportunity and all of the great investment and thought that's being put into them is definitely a win for privacy professionals and risk frameworks altogether. Awesome. Nelson, any, any further comments on the tooling? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's one of those cases where the traditional tooling is not enough. Uh, but there is there is tooling at the Robin's point. There is tooling that's emerging that can help you and um, really facilitate the development of these APIs following the principles that we've talked about. Uh, you know, even things like um, uh, some of the testing frameworks. Uh, you know, again, going back to the the question around validating inputs. I mean, those are all yes. I you know you you should do that. I mean, there's best practices there around what the API should allow. Um, and you know, I've seen or heard of situations where you know, people are pinging APIs with different values and seeing what the responses are and then try and correlate those responses to determine what's actually happening under the covers, which can actually then open an attack vector, right? So uh, so those kinds of things, you know, the tooling needs to help you capture just how they're being used or used, what's an abnormal usage versus a normal usage. Uh, and so, um, and the other, the other aspect of this is that 
I mean, you, you know, you, you've got to apply all the things around TLS and virus scanning and, you know, there, there's tools to help you with that API gateways, management platforms, throttling, so on and so forth. So that, you know, a lot of the tools are there, you have to use them. Um, you know, a lot of the talk now is around using things like AI ML to help you detect these kinds of situations where the APIs or the data they're exposing or, or returning is not what you think it should be or could be or um, doesn't conform to requirements. But the question is, where do those models come from in the first place and how do you explain what they're doing? So you can't just deploy an AI ML model and say, yes, I trust this AI ML model and it's doing all the right things and it's doing it from this point forward. Even, even something simple like a complete change in usage. Um, so for example, people all of a sudden moving on to uh, online shopping, that's a dramatic change in usage. I'm pretty sure the AI ML model did not take into account the pandemic when it was originally built. Uh, so how does that change what the AI ML model is actually doing? And how can you explain it, right? So there's that whole aspect too. It's, it's not all auto magic just because you're deploying these new tools that you can just suddenly say, oh yeah, no, I'm good. It conforms to all requirements and regulations and so on. You still need that element of explainability and be able to and, and trace and track and monitor and record everything that is going on, right? So the tools are there, they help. They're evolving to facilitate this new world of, and this, this interwoven world of APIs. Uh, there's still some work to do there though. Absolutely. Definitely uh, second that as a privacy professional. Absolutely. I was expecting a question on uh, open API spec. Uh, Swagger is uh, quite commonly used these days, uh, whether it's a, a microservice uh, or a, a Python or Java application, uh, where you define, design, define, and publish your APIs on Swagger. Uh, I would love to hear uh, your thoughts. Uh, even if uh, you know, you've seen uh, Swagger being used in your uh, organization or you've used it personally, um, uh, do you see that as the right direction? Do you see it being quite uh, comprehensive in terms of uh, tracking and monitoring risks um, and, and generally your experience with the open API specification? Yeah, I mean, just, yeah. just to start with that and touch on it, I mean, it's a specification. It helps you define APIs. It helps you standardize the way in which you approach and build your APIs. Uh, you know, it deals with things like payload schemas and paths and um, parameters and error handling and you know things like that. It, it really helps with standardization uh, around your APIs. Um, is it going to monitor and track and trace API data flows and application flows throughout your organization? No, <laughs> right? Doesn't help. So, so there's, you know, I think it helps because it, it does, it, it does apply a level of standardization, which means you have to deal with hopefully less permutations and combinations of the way in which these API contracts are defined, um, and the guidelines effectively that they're following. But you, all these other considerations that we've talked about, uh, I mean, that is not baked into the standard, right? Um, all it would give you is a, a cleaner way to provide organize uh, an external party with with uh, private data, right? So. It helps, it's it's a piece, but it, it's not the only piece. Absolutely. Robin, while you're uh, adding your thoughts to that, uh, I noticed you were answering a question about China, uh, the geopolitical angle of APIs. Uh, we've also seen some uh, controversy or, or some commentary around telecommunication equipment from China um, and how those APIs uh, you know, have trapped those uh, kind of vulnerabilities that can become geopolitical threats. Um, so, Robin, uh, would, uh, I noticed you were answering that question on the chat here. Would, would love your uh, comments for the rest of the audience as well. Right. So, you know, as an organization, like I think there's obviously the consumer angle and the enterprise angle. If you're an organization and you don't want your company's data to be stored in those areas, um, you want to definitely properly vet your vendors and APIs you're using to make sure that they're not storing any of that data in those regions and ask them that very specific question. Um, you know, do you have any customer support operations, for example, in China or any other region you don't want to have your data stored? So that's part of proper vetting. Um, as for the specific questions, I am not sure if there is a privacy tech tool checking on all the leaks of data that might be leaked to um, China. There could potentially be a tool out there. It's just not one that I have run across, but it, like um, Kamesh might even know if that's something data secrets could do or another privacy tech tool, but I'm not sure. Absolutely. Add it to the scrum plan of data secrets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 
Awesome. Uh, I, I, I feel this was a wonderful conversation, especially um, appreciated uh, all the very thoughtful, deep insights uh, from, from both of you on the panel. Uh, also, great appreciation to the uh, questions and the comments and the chats uh, that was going on online. I could barely keep up with both the conversations simultaneously. Uh, uh, thank you again, uh, Robin and Nelson, for joining us today and, and for all your uh, deep insights that you shared uh, with us and our community. Um, I see Matty also coming online there. Uh, so, Matty, uh, signaling the top of the hour. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. You guys were so incredible. Robin, Nelson, Kamesh, I learned so much. I think our audience did too. Audience members, you guys were amazing. We loved your questions. We loved your feedback. Loved the interaction. Um, please go check out Nelson's book. Please check out the book that Robin also recommended. Uh, and join us next week and next time for the Hive Think Tank series. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.